away from the edges or something. I'm not sure what's going to happen. How many people will really show up or what will happen when they do. Um, there's pizza in the back. There are drinks in the fridge out by the front. There's other types of food out by the front, including these nice Christmas. Um, the big red Eskimo plastic things are kind of weird. They're minty on the inside, so beware. Um, <coughs> tonight we have a talk by Shankar about natural language processing and machine learning. This, the reason this talk is here is because I have wanted to learn about NLTK for the longest time, and every time I talk to people about talks, they give, I just I like walk up to strangers and say NLTK, and if someone goes like this, then I say you're talking. And Shankar is the guy who didn't say no, so he's doing it tonight. And um, I think it's going to be awesome. I've seen some of the slides, not all of them, but it looks like a really good topic. Um, some other things to cover. We don't have a topic for January. So if anyone's got something they want to talk about, we might just do lightning talks. Um, or if you've got something you'd like to talk about, get in touch with me. Uh, if you're at all nervous, I can help you with the presentation. We can work something out. <coughs> you know, we're a very forgiving audience. Um, there's a Twitter feed called Boston Python, which has no tweets in it yet, because I haven't tweeted anything to it yet, because there's no followers, because I'm not sure exactly what should go on a Twitter feed like that. But if anyone's got some ideas, it's true. Charles is following me. Charles is the tweetiest of us all, um, and he has been following. But he, so therefore, he knows, you can vouch, there are no tweets. Exactly. Um, so ideas about what should go on that. I don't know if it's tweets about the Boston Python Meetup, or I think of interest to people who go to the Boston Python Meetup, or general stuff about Boston. I don't know. So if you've got ideas, let me know. Um, what else do I need to cover? Steve, what do I need to cover? Steve's a blank. OK. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Um, okay, where's Mark? Mark is over here. So, we're going to start with five minutes from Mark Stamos, right? Stagno, sorry. You come up here and say your own name. <laughs> What's your name? That's Mark Stagno. Stagno. Mark is an expert in the job market for Python, and he's going to talk for five minutes about what he knows about it. And I can speak from experience. I uh, currently work at HP, but my last day is this coming Friday. And the job I'm starting on at Monday, I got from an email onto the Boston Python meetup list. So it can be done. Mark. Uh, thanks, Dan. So yeah, Ned was nice enough to allow me to come here and speak tonight just uh, for a few minutes, talk a little bit about uh, the market and what I'm seeing, and um, talk a little bit about the service that I provide. I work for Winter Wyman, which has been in the area for quite some time in Boston. I work uh, specifically, uh, <laughs> I know some people. Um, I work specifically in the software market, so uh, I've been doing this for about four years, and I uh, just wanted to share some of my insight, insights in terms of what I'm seeing. So, probably kind of no surprise that we've seen a pretty big shift in the market over recent years. For, for one, for three years ago, probably 75% of the jobs that we saw was their Java and C Sharp. It seems like every new startup that's contacting us um, tends to be moving in the direction of something like Python. Uh, you know, a lot is obviously moved to the web-based space, so you know, whether it's Python, Django, or Ruby on Rails, or some sort of MVC framework. Um, some of the things that I've found from hiring managers that they're looking for when they when they find candidates, if it is something, you know, in that space where it's Python, Django, not too many people have experience with that in industry. You know, there's one camp that says you know, we need to have X amount of experience, you know, in industry, and it's pretty straightforward. And then there's another camp that says, you know. We're really looking for a certain type of person. You know, that would probably be a lot of folks like yourself who you know, are interested in studying things on the side or coming to groups like this and <coughs> collaborating. So there, there can be a lot to do to amplify your career if you haven't necessarily had experience with that particular technology. You know, maybe you're you've been a Java developer but you're just getting more impact on the side projects that you do can, can really go a long way. Um, as it relates to things that are more, you know, at the NLP or machine learning level, I found that it can be just more straightforward in terms of, you know, aptitude is one thing, but you really need to demonstrate this on the job I'm finding when we, when we do talk to our hiring manager. So we've got about 140 jobs right now uh, that we're working on, which is a lot better than about a year ago. So kind of a nice shift in terms of the dynamic. We spent a lot of time through the recession trying to, to build new relationships with clients, and, you know, money was tight in a lot of places. And now I think we're at a point where our phone is ringing a lot, which I think is indicative of the, the market improving quite a bit. Uh, to the point where I think a lot of hiring managers can't find enough good people. They often come to us and they're looking for that top 10 to 15% to 
said. Um, so in terms of the, the service that I provide, um, you know, everyone here has probably had some experience with a recruiter, whether that's that's good or bad. Um, you know, the approach that I offer and my company offers, and you know, our software group where there's nine of us, is one that I describe as low pressure, where you know, I'm a big fan of doing things like this, getting out and meeting people, talking well before they may be looking for work, learning as much as I can about people's backgrounds and you know where they want to take their career, uh, so that you know maybe I, I find oftentimes it's not black and white. You know, people are fairly happy at their job, but they're really interested in learning about new things, and if something better comes along, they'd like to hear about it. You know, I want to know what that target is if I'm, if I'm able to help someone. You know, blasting emails off or sending people's resume out and crossing my fingers I think is not a great approach. I think it's much more you know, collaborative and consultative to, to learn you know, what's, the, what's the best way to, to support folks. So that's just a little bit about the approach. And, you know, in addition to that, just sort of you know, resume writing. Um, you know, I mentioned sort of side projects earlier. One thing that, that comes to mind, and a lot of people come to me and they, they do work on the side or they, they are involved with things like this, but they don't put it on the resume. I think that can be a great thing to differentiate yourself you know, from other candidates if you are pursuing the market. You know, a separate section that says side projects. I think mean, years ago that wasn't necessarily the case. It's all about you know, what have you done in the industry. And I think there's been a little bit more of a, a shift towards embracing you know, the person who's really eager to learn new technologies and before uh, that. But, so, so I definitely welcome the opportunity to have dialogue with Folks who might be interested, I can leave some business cards in the back with the, the pizza there. But I want to stay within my few minutes, and then we got another presentation. So I definitely appreciate the time to uh, come to that. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, one more thing before we get started. I just want to note that Microsoft is donating the space and the food, both types of food tonight. So uh, think good thoughts about Microsoft. They're helping arbitrary technologists come and meet together without any preconception about what we might talk about here. And it's really a great thing for our boss So, Greca, are you okay. ready? Yes, I am. Okay, how do you feel about questions during the presentation? Um, no. Because there's a lot of slides, so, you know, I'm going to have to rush through it. But, uh, I mean, afterwards, it's, it's, it's always welcome. So, I'm going to ask questions during the presentation. I, I, I just won't respond. <laughs> this, this is the book, by the way, that we are raffling when the presentation is done. If you don't have a ticket, find Matt, and he'll give you one. There's Matt. Okay. Um, so. Okay. Um, I'm Shankar. I'm just going to put this up there because this is where all the source files are located for a lot of the examples that we're going through. Um, but. My name is Shankar. Uh, I am the mobile web developer at Lycos. Uh, they're all Lycosians, by the way. So, um, and basically, today I, uh, we're going to cover how to use NLTK, to kind of, uh, which is the natural language toolkit for Python, um, to kind of uh, parse through human-generated text. So, I think it's it's good if we first begin kind of explaining, you know, what is a natural language. Um, a natural language is, is, is you know, language that is, uh, that is learned by people at a very young age. It's nothing that's, you know, kind of uh, formally instructed to a person. I mean, uh, children at a very young age kind of pick this up on their own, very naturally. Um, so, it's a very difficult uh, field in computer science because, I mean, you basically have to go back and construct, you know, how do you, how do you think of words on the fly? How do you construct sentences in your head? Um, not only that, you could say the same exact thing a million different ways. And you could actually say one thing and then mean something else. Um, by the way, has, has everyone got this who wanted it? Um, I'm not done writing. Okay. <laughs> and so it's, it's, um, it's, it's a growing field and there's still a lot of paradoxes in it. It's, it's really hard to work with, but we're actually going to take a look at um, a lot of examples and how we're going to use the natural language toolkit to kind of um, get us there. Uh, a recommendation put that up in the uh, meetup. Okay. Okay. I, I don't use Twitter, but yeah, I mean, this, this could be a great time to use it. I'm, I'm finished. Finished? <laughs> awesome. Proceed. Okay, so we covered this. Uh, okay, so we're just going to look at a bunch of stuff. We're going to start off just covering kind of, uh, um, you know, some, some linguistics. So there's going to be a few key terms, and then a little bit later we're going to actually get into some coding, and we've got some examples that 
in the end, you're going to actually um, end up building some stuff that hopefully you'll find useful. All right. Um, yeah, I covered this. <coughs> actually. So it, it falls under the category of uh, machine learning, and more specifically computational linguistics. Uh, it sounds really complicated, but a lot of the stuff, once you know all the key terms and get past the jargon, it's really simple. And actually, LTK has a lot of documentation, like a lot of it. In fact, I, it's, it's insane how much they have. But there's a lot of jargon mixed in. And so to go through that, um, if you just start off in the middle, I know as, as a programmer myself, I just want to jump in and start creating something that's useful. And I don't want to have to you know, keep reading through this documentation, trying to figure things out, going back and looking at what these key terms mean. Um, so this is kind of what we're going to go through. So where is it used? It's several places. I mean, it's uh, natural language processing is, is serves as the back end of you know search engines, recommendation engines, um, fraud detection, spam filtering, knowledge bases, uh, basically anything uh, that requires uh, the system to kind of know the intent of what people meant. And in fact, um, the web is full of data. But I mean, if you can't get through this data, it's, it's pretty much useless. If you can't get through this and make meaning of it, it's useless. Okay, so a couple of paradoxes and some things that machines uh, generally will have difficulty with um, are sentiment, ambiguity, um, intent, so you know what you meant. Things like sarcasm. If you just uh, gave text to uh, a program and told it to kind of try to pull out the sarcasm, or you know, tell it to detect where the sarcasm occurs, it would probably have a very hard time doing that. Um, also things like context, emphasis on certain words, um, time and date, I mean, Google has, has become a verb, you know, to Google things uh, in recent time. And, you know, before, I mean, before 2001, that it really didn't, it really wasn't that widespread. So there's a lot of things kind of to take into, uh, take into account. <coughs> Um, so one of the things is context. So this is actually something that happened last week. Uh, you know, my little sister said, what's your name? And I said, Shankar. She said, can you spell it? I started to spell it, S-H-A. And she goes, wrong. It's spelled I-T, and she starts laughing. Um, but you can see how the meaning of this is, is just completely, it's different. she meant something completely different. And I took it as something else. And then I told her, you know, I bet, I can't, I bet you can't spell your name. And she starts spelling her name, so I win. <laughs> so ambiguity. This is the next, uh, next thing. This is kind of interesting, actually. Um, so let's say this is kind of a weird sentence to begin with, but let's say we have the sentence, I shot the man with ice cream. So does that mean the man with the ice cream was shot? Or do you mean a man had, the man had ice cream shot at him? This sentence is totally correct. I mean, Syntactically, it's completely correct, and there's no way that if you fed this into a program by parsing this, you could actually tell you know what it actually meant. So it's a very ambiguous statement. Um, language translation is uh, is also a complicated matter, and actually this is a this is a good link. Um, we'll we'll take a look at how to do this using NLTK, but um, on the web, if you go to this site, <coughs> basically what they have is a system where you put in something in English, any sentence, and it translates it from English. To German, to English, to German, or whatever language you specify, until it bottoms out where the translation from English to German and back is exactly the same. And so you can actually see how uh, how ridiculous it gets. So we start off with the problem with communication is the illusion that it has occurred. It goes to German. I'm not going to read the German. So 